In this week's episode, eBay is going to hit sneakerheads with some fees. Amazon changes their FBA restrictions, but too late for the holidays. And Eric Clapton changes his tune. What is up, Galaxians? Welcome to the post-Christmas, pre-New Year's Day edition of the Galaxy CDs, Rocks and Flips Reseller Talk podcast. Thanks for stopping by. I hope everybody had a great Christmas. If this is your first time here at the channel, my name is Ryan and I am a full-time reseller, part-time YouTuber and podcaster working out of my home down here in a very messy bat cave. <laughs> Uh, and this channel is all about the flip life. We will bring you reselling news, things that I think are relevant to the world of reselling, and we'll generally do a quick what sold recap. So all of that introductory noise out of the way. News updates. Let's get right to the reselling news. Uh, we're going to start by recapping a couple of things from last week's episode. If you caught that, we talked about some things that were going on and there have since been some updates. So first up, we talked about Mercari was having a payment issue. Deposits, direct deposits that were processed seemingly mostly on December 13th had not hit sellers accounts as of early last week. And we talked about how Mercari had not been really responsive to that situation. Shortly after I recorded that video, they did reach out to effective, affected sellers. Uh, they noted Mercari would like to inform you that there was a technical issue in processing your direct deposit request made during the week of 12, 13 through the 17th. Again, I have not talked to anyone whose deposits other than on the 13th were affected, but Mercari is saying that there were some later in that week as well. The issue has been resolved and funding instructions have been issued to your bank as of today, December 22nd. They had reached out to some sellers individually on the 21st with kind of that same message. So this is something that they were working on last week. Please note that direct deposits can take three to five business days from the time they have been issued from Mercari. If you do not receive your deposit after that time, please contact our customer support team. We apologize for the inconvenience. Sellers that I talked to over the last week, by and large, all had their direct deposits that were missing by Christmas Eve, by Friday the 24th. So kudos to Mercari for finally acknowledging that this was not problems with sellers' banks or with the sellers themselves, and that it was something that was on their end in their connection to the ACH system and getting it resolved to their credit. They did also, I understand, issue $10 coupons, good for any purchase of $20 or more over on Mercari to affected sellers to try to ease the pain a little bit. So good on them for that. Um, they should have been a little bit more out front. Their initial communication with sellers was not particularly great, uh, but as they say, all's well that ends well. Another thing that we talked about uh, Eric Clapton had, as it turns out, it was his lawyers, of course, <laughs> uh, but he had sued a woman over an alleged bootleg CD that she was attempting to sell for uh, effectively 11 U.S. dollars. Um, it got a lot of bad press, as you can imagine, for that. And Eric Clapton's management sort of regrets suing German Widow over attempted $11 bootleg CD sales. So after a spate of bad publicity over winning a Goliath versus David lawsuit, Eric Clapton's management has announced that it does not intend to collect the money owed by a German woman who was sued for putting a bootleg CD of a 1980s Clapton concert up for sale on eBay. Good deal. <laughs> uh, the woman had been ordered to pay approximately $4,000 after a judge ruled she had infringed his copyright by trying to sell the more than 30-year-old CD, which her late husband allegedly had purchased from a department store. The illicit disc was removed from the site after a day and was not actually sold in, what, in response to what it often called rather often misleading press reports. Clapton's management team released a statement Wednesday effectively recognizing that it had not been a good look to go after a woman who apparently hadn't even realized she was breaking the law, even as at the same time they blamed essentially her lawyers for not just settling this case when it was brought to their attention. It never really should have gone to trial. 
Uh, when the full facts of this particular case came to light and it was clear the individual is not the type of person Eric Clapton or his record company wished to target Eric Clapton decided not to take any further action and does not intend to collect the costs awarded him by the court. Also, he hopes the individual will not herself incur any further costs. Management, for their part, described the action as a fairly automated response to what they call rampant piracy in Germany and noted that 95% of respondents who are threatened with similar claims settle out of court. The statement also minimized the musician's participation, of course. <laughs> Uh, in the legal action, they note Germany is one of several countries where sales of unauthorized and usually poor quality illegal bootleg CDs are rife, which harms both the industry and purchasers of inferior product, his management statement said. Over a period of more than 10 years, the German lawyers appointed by Eric Clapton and a significant number of other well-known artists and record companies have successfully pursued thousands of bootleg cases under routine copyright procedures. So... I guess they've got to do this, especially if it is rife in, in Germany. If you live over in Europe, what's your experience with uh, counterfeit and bootleg CDs? Is it as bad as his management claims that it is? But uh, good on them for recognizing, I guess, even if it was a little too late, the, uh, the error of their ways going after <laughs> a little old lady trying to make 10 bucks. So moving on, uh, up in Canada... If you are in Ontario, uh, be wary of trying to sell COVID-19 rapid tests. You could face up to one year in jail and massive fines. The Ontario government is working to track down anyone who sells these tests. As it turns out, these tests were provided free of charge by the Canadian government. So that probably adds a layer of complexity to this thing. The article says you can sell a toaster, old furniture, and cars, but you can't resell rapid antigen tests unless you want to pay a very pretty penny. In response to the Omicron variant, Ontario started giving out free rapid take-home antigen test kits at LCBOs and other locations across Ontario on December 17th. However, some individuals have been reselling the test kits online on Craigslist and TikTok, they say. Quote, at a time when Ontario families are turning to rapid antigen tests to provide an additional layer of protection against COVID-19, it is deplorable to see bad actors reselling test kits provided free of charge by the provincial government, said Ross Romano, Minister of Government and Consumer Services. We are proactively working to identify, track down, and fine any businesses or individuals who may be in breach of our government's emergency order, which prohibits charging unfair prices for necessary goods. The fines are pretty astonishing. Anyone found of reselling a rapid antigen test could face a $750 fine. If they are summoned to court and convicted, they could face one year in jail and a $100,000 fine as a maximum penalty. If a company director or officer is convicted, they could also face a year in jail and a fine up to $500,000 and a corporation could face a fine of up to $10 million. So uh, no bueno, don't sell the antigen kits. Uh, get one for yourself for free and use it as <laughs> prescribed. Wow, that is, uh, that's crazy. And the, the pandemic has, it's been a boon for resellers. It has really been good. You've seen it in the reports that we've covered on this podcast numerous times over the last couple of years, how it's been good for the platforms and individual sellers, but it has also kind of brought out the worst in some of these folks with stuff like this. So moving on to Etsy, um, sellers were discussing their frustration with Etsy's search engine on a recent discussion board thread. The original poster said searches for a specific sewing pattern, including the name and number would result in listings for other pattern numbers. If you've ever searched for anything, and it's this is not an Etsy really specific problem. This obviously addresses Etsy specifically, but you see the same thing on eBay or Amazon. It doesn't really matter how much information you put in. It brings up what would appear to be irrelevant search results. So we'll get into that a little bit as we kind of pursue this article. If I search for silver plated B bracelet, for instance, it's two pages before I get to anything with all of those actual words. I also, the poster said, get the letter B instead of B, and I'm sorry, but Sterling Cat Earrings, why? Uh, this is on e-commerce bites. They did a little test themselves. They did the same search uh, to see what Etsy would display. The first row of results showed ads 
And to their credit, they were exact matches. All four were B bracelets, but the rest of the page featured a mix of B bracelets, non B bracelets, and even some other kinds of items. They did notice that uh, many of the bracelets on the first page of the search results that did not match the search term were labeled bestseller, popular now, or free shipping. Another seller who commented on that post had a theory to explain why Penelope stayed home, wrote, Etsy has a search designed to facilitate a purchase from browsers. They actually like it this way. And this is exactly true. I, I think this person captured this situation perfectly. They have decided, presumably based on data and testing, which they are obsessed with, that most people coming here don't know exactly what they want, but will be swayed by popular choices and, hey, look at that kind of stuff. The site has been hammered in marketing as a special place for unique gifts. It's a good, it's good in a way. Just now I searched wax melts and saw some made to look like miniature donuts. I would never have thought to look for something like that. There's no shortage of people on Etsy selling unique things no one would think to look for. And in that sense, a search like this is helpful. And that is exactly true. If you go in searching generically for something and Etsy recommends things that they think based on their data and search history might be of interest to you, you can potentially find something that you didn't even know you were looking for, which is Etsy's goal in the end. They're just trying to sell you something. So all of the sites do this. They bring up related, but not necessarily, necessarily easy for me to say, relevant results in the searches. So it, it kind of is what it is. On the one hand, it benefits the broader kind of general buyer. But if you are looking for something very specific, you do have to kind of wade through the chaff, as it were, to find what you're looking for. She goes on to say, relevant no longer means accurate to the search. Instead, it means what's most likely to end in a sale when this search term is used. So let me know what your experience is, either on Etsy or elsewhere. Uh, if you're here this morning live in the chat, feel free to leave it in the chat. Otherwise, you can leave it in the comments or... If you are listening to the podcast, you can, of course, send me an email at galaxycds at gmail.com, or there is a link in the show notes where you can actually record and send me a voice message, which I may play in a future episode. Last week, eBay very quietly removed the image search function from their iOS and Android apps. Had I not stumbled on this news article, I would not have been aware of that because I don't use that particular feature, but they have disabled this search by image function in the latest update of its mobile apps. The feature, which was originally introduced in 2017, enabled users to take a picture of an object such as a shoe or a shirt and find items on the marketplace that closely match the object in the image. But now, for reasons unknown, eBay has removed the feature from its own apps as confirmed by an eBay eBay staff account in the eBay community forums, quote, the image search fun functionality has been temporarily, they say, turned off for both the iOS and Android apps. No additional information was offered by eBay. They are, however, making some changes in the coming weeks to their privacy policy, among other things, and this may be related to that. Uh, there's obviously a big push regarding photo images and face recognition and that sort of stuff. And this may play into part of that. So they have not specified why they have made this change, but there you go. Uh, CEO eBay, Jimmy Iannone, was on CNBC's Closing Bell last week, and he was asked uh, some pretty tough questions, to be fair, over there. And one of them was if he felt that eBay was driving smaller sellers to other sites such as Etsy or Mercari. In terms of some of the recent strategy changes you've enacted, I know you've been focusing on the top 20% of sellers who in fact generate the top 75% of gross merchandise volume. I can understand why you would given those statistics, but at the same time, has that had an effect of driving some smaller sellers to other rival platforms like Etsy? I know and responded, no. <laughs> uh, he did actually go on to say some other things, but uh, one of the beauties of eBay, he said, is a brand new seller could sell alongside a larger seller. You can get up and on the platform really easily and start selling. 
I'm not totally sure I agree with that. Um, eBay, of all of the platforms, is probably the most difficult to actually navigate the selling process. But um, in, a, in a general sense, I guess he would be correct. In fact, he went on to say, we recently put out a report that 84% of people started selling on eBay because they needed extra income during the pandemic. And another 14% did so because they lost their job. I assume that is referring only to new sellers to the platform during the pandemic, because those two numbers add up to 98% of sellers. Um, and that clearly is not based on the total number of sellers on eBay. He says, and you know, eBay's had a big impact on individuals during this pandemic, especially women who 80% of them turn to eBay during some financial or other hardship. You can see the full interview over on CNBC. There is a YouTube version embedded in this particular article, which I will of course link to in the show notes and the video description below. You can let me know what you think of eBay's current tactics. Uh, jumping into the chat here, JRKR1964. Notice this feature was removed and I'm not happy. Hubby and I use that a lot referring to the the photo image search. So hopefully that's something that they put back on there. I know a lot of folks used it. Um, they have been hyping a similar service with like the the gaming cards, like the Yu-Gi-Oh and the, all those cards where you can take a picture of the card and find it. So I would assume that this is something that they're just ironing, ironing out some kinks on, but uh, very surprising to see them remove a feature that I know people were using. We have talked uh, several times on this show about eBay's new promoted listings advanced beta, which is their cost per click advertising model for sellers. They recently did a podcast over on eBay. There will be a link again in this article to it where they interviewed a reseller who is using it, who had some tips. Jeffrey Radspinner runs an eBay store called Venture Surplus. He sells military surplus. He's been selling on eBay for 11 years and has been operating that particular account for seven years. He appeared on the eBay for Business podcast last week to talk about his experience. And as I have said several times on this podcast, quote, the program is not for every seller, he said. <laughs> uh, and he almost perfectly described my particular case. It is not a good fit, for, good fit for sellers of one of a kind items. It is better for things that you have several of or a whole lot of, and you can just keep restocking it because then you've got a comp campaign that's just gonna run forever and you do the work one time and you're done, he said. Whereas with a single listing, you're going to do all that work and you're going to have to do all that work again for your next listing. So spot on for those of us that are primarily doing like garage sale, estate sale, one off vintage items and unusual pieces, the cost per click method, unless it is something really, really rare and unusual that's going to command really, really high dollar value, probably does not make sense because you're going to have to constantly do new ads and you're going to get a lot of clicks that don't turn into anything. Whereas if you have an item that you can quickly replenish that you always have on hand and you want to drive a lot of traffic to that multi quantity listing, this thing may make perfect sense for you. So he did offer some additional tips. And this is one that's pretty standard in the cost per click uh, model. Don't automatically use the keywords or the budget that eBay suggests and do a lot of testing. For example, he said when he was planning a campaign for cold weather gloves, eBay was suggesting a lot of broad keywords to bid on. If gloves gets 28,000 monthly searches, he doesn't want to pay for 28,000 people to see ads that aren't relevant to all of them. So narrow your keywords. If you're going to use this, you want it to be very specific so that only people who are genuinely interested in your specific type of item are going to go and click on that ad. He usually scrolls, he says, through those suggested keywords and selects the ones that he thinks are most relevant. Then he'll go in and add some customized keywords, things that he says he would search for if he was looking for that item. He admits he doesn't know for sure that that necessarily means anyone else is gonna search with those words, but I like them to be in there. And then importantly, he can go back and collect data on that and see if those keywords are being effective. He also adds that he uses negative keywords, which are words where he doesn't want his listings to show up. For example, leather gloves. He doesn't want to pay for clicks from shoppers looking for leather gloves since it's too broad of a term 
for the particular type of military glove he sells. Once he's selected his keywords, he sets his bid generally between 10 and 20 cents per click. They do note that he had been doing uh, Google ads previously, so he was very familiar with how cost per click advertising works, which probably gave him a leg up on this process. But this is a really interesting article, uh, which again, I will link to in the show notes below. It is on the ever-present e-commerce bites. You may have seen, and we have talked about on this show, I would hate to think how many times <laughs> uh, over the last six months about the impending changes to the tax requirements for the 1099K form that payment processors and platforms like eBay and Amazon are required to send out. eBay posted a notice late last week that they uh, will have a mandatory collection of social security numbers for those sellers. eBay announced on December 20th that they will be required to collect social security numbers or individual tax identification numbers if you are a, a business and you have a, a TIN or an EIN, a, a employer identification number, something that they can tie to your business or to you specifically, from all sellers who sell product over the course of the year worth more than $600. Once that threshold is reached, eBay will require sellers to provide their full nine digit social security number or individual tax identification number before they can continue to sell on the platform. Failure to provide this information will result in three bad things. Payouts being put on hold, the ability to list on the platform may be restricted, and most importantly, eBay may also deduct backup withholding from future payouts, which is, I believe, 24%. So you don't want any of that to happen. This really should come as no surprise to anybody who has been following along with this new 1099K requirement. The only way for eBay to follow the law and to enforce this policy is, of course, to collect these social security and tax identification numbers. So if you want to play in their sandbox, you're going to have to provide it. This is not just going to be an eBay issue. Every platform, every payment processor, PayPal, and so on, they're all going to be impacted by this. So you're going to be giving that information out, uh, unfortunately, regardless. So be prepared for that. Um, I have seen also a few reselling videos, YouTube channels that have have started giving some tax advice. And as I always pretty much say when I talk about tax stuff, I am not a tax accountant or a tax lawyer. I bring you the news and you need to sort out what you want. But in the spirit of YouTube channels giving out tax advice, I'd like to give you two pieces of tax advice. Number one, do not take tax advice from a YouTube reseller. And number two, talk to your tax accountant. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. I'm fairly comfortable with doing my own taxes, but I would never presume to give anyone else tax advice. If I do something on my taxes and I muck it up and the IRS comes after me, that's one thing. If I give you tax advice and the IRS comes after you, that is something entirely different. And I don't think you or I, either one, should put ourselves in that position. So uh, you can take that and do with it what you will, but... Uh, that would be my recommendation. Talk to your accountant. Don't don't take tax advice from another reseller on YouTube. <laughs> uh, your individual tax situation could be entirely different. So there you go. Back to Canada. Uh, eBay has extended their free listing promotion. It has been extended to March 29th of next year. The offer was zero insertion fees for Canadian sellers' first 100,000 listings. It was originally scheduled to end on December 31st, but they say, quote, we have received such positive feedback from the seller community. No kidding. <laughs> uh, especially in these challenging times of COVID supply chain uncertainties and more that we have decided to continue this offer through the first few months of 2022. They do note existing selling limits do apply, including category and item limits. Terms and conditions can be found on the eBay Canada announcement board page. So if you are in Canada, congratulations. You are going to continue to get 100,000 free listings. How do I get in on that action? I guess I got to move to Canada. I have joked regularly that if Canada was where Mexico is, I'd already have moved. But <laughs> uh, I'm not a fan of the cold, so that's not going to work for me. I mentioned in the intro 
eBay is going after the sneakerheads. Uh, this was all but inevitable that this gravy train was eventually going to come to an end, and it will end officially on January 19th. As eBay continues to invest in our platform, we are making changes to final value fees in men's and women's sneakers listed in the athletic shoes category. Effective January 19th of 2022, the final value fee for sneakers over $100 will be 8%. If you are a basic or above store subscriber, it will be 7%. Insertion fees, they note, will continue to be waived for listings with a starting price over $100. There is a link to a really detailed frequently asked questions section. So you'll, if you're a sneaker seller, you'll want to check that out. They are going to great lengths to point out that they will remain the most competitive destination for sneaker resale, even with this change, they will have the lowest fees among competing marketplaces and offer the latest resources to help accelerate, grow, and scale your business. No fee verified returns, seller protections, authenticity guarantee, and more. They note they have authenticated about 2 million sneakers globally with a pair of sneakers purchased every four seconds. They have a handy little chart here, which you can see on the screen if you're watching on YouTube comparing their fees to GOAT, StockX, and Stadium Goods. And they are, in fact, still the cheapest. But if you have not, um, I don't, I don't, what, was there a fee previously? Was it zero or was it something just less than 8%? If you're a sneaker seller, you can let me know in the comments. I don't sell in that category. So I can't say from personal experience, but uh, it's going to 8%, 7% if you have a store. They, eBay also published some important updates for 2022 shipping carrier rate changes. As we approach the end of the holiday peak season, carrier applied rates and surcharges will be ending. USPS returned to their normal rates on December 26th. So a tip to you media sellers, four ounce and under right now is in many cases cheaper first class than it is media rate mate. Wow. Media mail rate. Wow. That was butchered. <laughs> uh, so be sure to check that. If you're selling some stuff, CDs, DVDs, and that, that are four ounces or less, it may be beneficial to ship first class at least until January 9th when the new rates go into effect at UP USPS. Priority mail and Priority Mail Express are going up a little over 3%. First class package is going up 8.8%, .8%, which is a big, big jump. And we'll most likely put those four ounce and under items back over the media rate. Priority Mail International is also going up about 4% and First Class Package International is a little more than 4%. FedEx does have a 5.9% rate increase that goes into effect January 3rd and FedEx Ground Economy is going up 6.9%. If you buy your US, UPS, UPS labels on eBay, those fees at the present time are still not going up. So kudos to eBay for negotiating with UPS to keep those rates the same. So be aware of that. Uh, we are currently back on the previous version of the USPS and FedEx rates, but coming up in the next week or so, all of that is going back up. Last bit of news for this week. Amazon made an announcement that on January 1st, it will reduce the inventory performance index threshold for FBA storage limits to 400. They note that with this change, less than 10% of sellers will have storage volume limits. Amazon also said it had increased the amount of product sellers could send in during the holiday season. In recent weeks, we've been further able to increase the restock limits for many sellers, not all, but many and intend to do the same for many more sellers early next year. As always, it encouraged sellers to do their part by analyzing aging in excess inventory. As we continue to launch new solutions to help your business, we're excited for you to try some new and improved tools that can help you and add new selection to FBA or maintain sufficient inventory levels. They go on to provide some examples. For help on accelerating new product sales, see the FBA new selection program's expanded benefits on storage and advertising costs. To maximize selection that is eligible for one-day delivery, see your restock inventory recommendations and for personalized recommendations on how to recover value from your aging and excess inventory, which is what's really important to them. They want to get that old junk out of their warehouses. Go to manage inventory health. Some sellers, however, 
as is always the case, I guess, but uh, were bitter over the restrictions they had faced during the holiday season. One seller said, quote, increasing my limits for a seasonal product on December 20th does nothing. So you can, if you're a seller on Amazon, you can find out all of that information over on Amazon Seller Central. And you can let me know in the comments what you think of that. Uh, if you're an FBA seller, I know I get a lot of um, comments from Bird Knows Best, who is a big uh, Amazon FBA a seller. And he has indicated he's gone to a lot of Fulfilled by Merchant. It just doesn't make sense, unfortunately, any longer for him to do Amazon FBA. So let us know in the comments what your thoughts are on Amazon FBA. And speaking of selling. Let's have a look-see at just a small handful of items that I've sold over the last week. It has, uh, the holidays, you can, again, let me know in comments, how was your holiday season? I My expectation was that I would be up about 10%, give or take, to a normal month here at the Galaxy, and that has not worked out to be the case. I am actually just about on par with a normal month. Last December, I had a terrific month. I'm down about 30% actually to last December with a relative handful of days to go. It has picked up post Christmas. The Christmas weekend was actually really, really good for me. Uh, and this week has been good, but leading into the holiday, um, it was pretty sucky, <laughs> uh, if I'm being completely honest. But I did sell a few things and let's jump in here. This first one, I've talked about these books before. Uh, it's Simple, Recipes by Ann Heller from the Journal Herald. This was from 1980 in Dayton, Ohio. Again, it's a local newspaper published recipe book. These things generally, they're not huge money, but you can usually pick them up for less than 50 cents. A lot of these I own for a nickel in a bulk buy. Uh, if I see a big stack of them and they look interesting, I'll just offer two bucks for all of them or whatever and walk out with dozens. So this went for $20 plus media mail shipping. I expected this actually to sell close to the Dayton area that somebody who, who knew Anne or followed her when she was writing for the newspaper would buy it. I don't know if that's the case, but this went all the way to California. <laughs> uh, next up, a book. Uh, this was part of a big lot that I bought of Gosh, I was 45 boxes of books from my friend Brian, and it's a real mixed bag of stuff. This is one of the first things that I listed, and it's one of the first things that sold over on Mercari, a first printing hard uh, hardcover with dust jacket from Terry Goodkind, Goodkind, Wizard's First Rule. This went for $22 with free shipping on an offer. I think I had it listed for like 25 bucks. Um, I own... My best guess is these books are, I've probably got 50 cents a piece in them, something like that. I haven't finished counting them yet, but something like that. So that's not a bad flip and a nice way to get started recouping my investment on that purchase. This was a really interesting old set of books. I picked these up at an estate sale. I, I think I paid a buck for this box of, they're small, they're like four by six stories of opera. So it was 100 symphonic favorites, 100 operas, 100 composers. It was a four book box set from the 1940s. I got it for a dollar. It sold for $29.74 plus free shipping on an offer. Really neat old piece. The box was a little raggedy looking, but it was still there. The dust covers kind of the same thing, a little rough around the edges, but for a set of books that is, gosh, effectively maybe 80 years old. It was in fairly good condition and brought a reasonably decent money. This was also part of the big lot that I bought from my friend uh, from 1941, a version of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And I misspelled her name in the title and still managed to sell this thing for $36 <laughs> uh, plus shipping. This came out in 1941 and was on the old Triangle Books publishing company and was tied into the MGM release of the movie with, um, I believe it was Lawrence Olivier. So really interesting piece. There were not a lot of these out there and they were selling on average for anywhere from 30 to about $45. I 
I listed mine for $39.99 or best offer. This sold actually through the global shipping program for 36 bucks plus shipping. I think all in the buyer paid about $70 for this. So uh, I wouldn't, but I'm glad somebody did. <laughs> This was another, uh, I believe, global shipping program sale. Someone uh, discovered my massive collection of CDs online and bought four items. These were, I believe, three of the four of these were new. Severin, Acid to Ashes, Rust to Dust, Blue Tip Discord number 101, The Crows self-titled, not to be confused with The Black Crows. This was somebody different. And A Wilderness of Mirrors by Paul K. and The Messengers. These four CDs totaled $55.46 with free shipping. They were shipped down to the Kentucky Global Shipment Center and they're on their way. So I own these CDs. These were all part of the big lot. So I've got maybe 15 cents in this whole lot and sold for 55 bucks. This was a really interesting piece. This was part of a big lot of books that I got for free from an estate clean out back in the summer. 1965 Ford V8 double overhead cam 255 competition engine booklet, second edition. Hardly any of these out there sold comps were at about $75 a piece, which frankly blew me away, especially since I don't have any cost of goods sold in this. This sold for my full asking price of $74.99 plus media mail shipping. So this went actually to a garage. So this is somebody who probably does car restoration and maybe has one of these engines and needs some, needs some help with it. It was like a assembly and instruction manual, really neat piece in excellent shape. Uh, 75 bucks from a cost of goods sold of zero. And this is the flip of the week. These books individually are not worth much of anything. Uh, they are illustrated classic editions. They are paperback books geared towards children, published in, looked like the late 1960s by Moby Books. They're pocket sized, they're very small. The big lot that I purchased, again from my friend Brian, had about 23 or 24 of these. There were a couple of duplicates. Again, individually, they're worth about five bucks a piece, free shipping, which did not make any sense to me. So I put these things together in the biggest lot that I could make out of those books. I saw a similar lot of, I think, 22 that sold for $125. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to try these at $99 plus shipping. And they were listed less than 24 hours and sold for the full price, $99.99 plus Customer paid media mail shipping. Again, my cost of goods sold is probably 50 cents a piece on these. So I might have 10 bucks total in this thing and sold for hundred dollars. That is a pretty reasonable return on investment. I would say you can let me know what you think. <laughs> uh, if that was a good, good investment, I like buying those big lots of old books. It's a lot of work. I don't know if you can see over my shoulder. I again, I'm in a position where I literally have books everywhere. Uh, lots of good mornings here in the chat this morning. Good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. I know the kind of mid holiday period here maybe is not the best time to be trying to do this, but I wanted to get back on the horse and do another live. I hope that you all had a great holiday and that you enjoy your new years. Uh, I will put in my shameless plug for UC football. Uh, no roll tide over here. Let's go Bearcats Friday at three 30 um, I will be turning off my phone, <laughs> uh, and watching my beloved Bearcats play in their, uh, semifinal game. So with that, I'm going to close it for this week. Again, thank you so much for coming by. Have a happy new year. Enjoy the holiday, stay safe and be well.